So uh, I'm very excited to welcome Ariel Harvey to DMA. Um, as you'll see, the work she's been doing um, illustration is part of my constantly working uh, collaboration um, called Tale of Tales. Um, is really, for me, a very, very exciting example of you know the potential of games as a creative form. The work is both visually stunning and conceptually challenging, and I think signals a kind of beacon of hope for games. Um, I think particularly exciting about the work is um, an engagement with with a, a way of making visuals in games that usually belong to the AAA game industry, uh, and most indie game makers and art game makers don't engage with the full potential of 3D world building, and Tale of Tales do, and I think um, that's really quite rare and exciting to see. Um, and the games are conceptually challenging, as I've said, um, and really challenge the notions of what games are and can be. Um, so I'm very excited to have Aria here. We've tried for many years to bring her, so I'm happy to <laughs> have it be a reality. So I'll read your short bio. Um, sorry, this is from you, so I should be correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, like, which is good. It's not on the mic, right? But someone should turn it up if they can. They probably have a dial knob. Okay. So um, this luckily does not include the super long list of shows that people often add, other people add to one's bio. So <laughs> um, Aria Harvey is a visual artist who creates an inter in interactive and traditional media. She is one half of the game development duo Tale of Tales, where she has been a game designer, art director, and 3D artist. Over the course of 12 years, Tale of Tales released eight games, including The Endless Forest, The Path, the Graveyard, Luxuria Superba, Superbia, sorry, and Sunset, the most recent game. Currently, she is chief architect of Cathedral in the Clouds, a VR and cross-media project for the production of sacred art. Right. <laughs> she lives and works in Ghent, Belgium. So please help me welcome Aria. Hello everyone, is this, it's working, yeah? Okay, good, I'm gonna try to put this in a good position. Um, let me know if I'm not speaking loud enough or whatever, too loud, whatever. Um, yes, a little closer. It's hard because this is all down so low. Um, yeah, all right. I'll try, standing in this unnatural position, I will begin my talk. Um, Yes, um, my name is Aria, and I am the one choosing tonight. Choosing My Own Adventure is sort of just this series of talks. I've been in the States since late March or mid-March, um, and doing a series of talks at different places. Um, and it's kind of a weird time for me to be doing talks because we don't, we don't, don't have any project that we've just finished and I'm not trying to sell anything or promote anything or whatever. I'm just sort of here, you know? Um, and the thing is, I've given four talks. You are the last. It's hard for me to believe I've made it. I've made it this far. Um, and uh, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about, because we don't have anything we're really prepared to show you like new work or something. I was like, I just started typing and typing and trying to figure out what has been obsessing me these last six months. Um, we've made video games for these 13, 12, 13 years as Tale of Tales and now we're not making video games anymore. Um, this was a decision we made for all kinds of reasons that I hope I will enlighten throughout the course of this talk. But um, that um, it felt like, okay, you know all the, those, those choose your own adventure books, you know, and like, you're, you're, you know, it's a story and you flip to a certain point and you get, uh, sometimes you get a bad ending. There's this great Tumblr called uh, youchoserong.tumblr.com 
which is just the best and it's just this person is obsessed with like the bad endings like is posting all the bad endings from choose your own adventure stories so i was going through this tumblr and trying to think about this thing and all the things it's like right now i'm in a big moment of choosing lots of new things for myself choosing new experiences so all of these types of things especially as i was entering entering into this series of talks just felt like fortune cookies for like my life right now it's like you have one last chance is that it is that what you want you know it's like that sort of thing and so it sort of felt like yeah i'm gonna do this all across america you know you guys are the last ones yay let's hear it for la sucker you know um and um but when I th thought about choosing and you know the choices I was making in these four files I had on my computer and these thoughts that I had, I realized that um, that my life was um, that this is but one choice that I've made in a long series of choices. We'll say professionally and personally, but we're going to talk for just one one moment about my complete resume. Um, in my 44 years of life, I have worked at a framing store. That's a job I had when I was 16 years old. I mean, this will be good for you students who are studying something and you think you're gonna do one thing their whole life or something. It's like, I worked in a framing store when I was 16 years old. The game, it's, a, it's a, a, a job I got because there was a cute boy who worked there and I thought he would notice me or something. Then when I was 18, I got a job at the Children's Museum of Indian Indianapolis, Indiana, which is where I'm from. And I was lu very lucky, I lucked into this job where they just wanted three uh, seniors in high school or recently um, graduated students to work on museum exhibits. And that became like a really formative uh, thing for me actually. Um, I worked, then I went to New York City and I worked in a computer lab at Parsons School of Design. It was the first computer lab, so this is like around 1990. Um, First computer lab at Parsons, there's like six Macs in a room and three PCs in another room and I'm programming 3D models and leaving them to render overnight to slide film. Um, aside from that, I had to work my way through school because I was super broke, so I worked at two copy stores, one of which is still open, I found out um, when I was in New York City at the beginning of this whole thing, which made me super happy for some reason. Um, um, then I was a computer tutor fresh out of school. I tutored people in things like Quark Express and other dead programs. Um, I was fired from this job. <laughs> and then I worked at a publishing house because desktop publishing was in. I, was a dis I immediately ga gained a high position because I knew how to use computers. Um, teaching art directors who are old school, putting stuff together, how to use, how to lay out their stuff in computers. Um, then that led to several like sort of temp jobs in advertising hell slave ships where they would take young creative people and you know give them lots of money to like you know air airbrush uh, um, billboards or you know translate their marketing pamphlets into HTML, which is when I got wise and made my own website and yeah learned came to independent HTML net art heaven. We'll call it that meaning I had my own sort of web business such as it was at the time, which was basically me in my room with my T1 line, like making websites and art for uh, the people and myself. And that was all happening in cyberspace. My cyberspace period is my favorite period of my life, actually, even to this day, I remember it so very fondly, um, meaning that it, everything was sort of virtual, you were not you, I'm not me, I, nobody had names, we didn't know where they were from. It was anonymous, but not obnoxious like it is today. Um, and then at a certain point, um, somewhere in the cyberspace period, I met my husband, another reason why it was my favorite period of time. And we got together and we did cyberspace things for a while, but then at a certain point we chose for video games. In 2002, we chose for video games. And now I'm telling you that there's this dot, 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 and I'm choosing for something else and yet I don't know what it is. Um, but one thing that I chose for when I chose video games, even before, I mean, I'm trained as a sculptor, uh, what I chose for when I chose video games was to, I chose years and years of my life working in environments like this. This is Blender 3D. And uh, I chose not only for this, but okay, we chose for a medium, which is software. Software, has, we've always been adamant software is our medium of our work. For me, this has been my material. These polygons, these gray things, these things that I'll make appear to be one thing or another, to live or die or you know make people have fantasies. You know, this is my material. This is my choice, and I and I still choose for this, for some reason. 
uh, I guess after all these years, I'm kind of addicted to it. I was never one of those people who like did 3D, like, oh, I have to have the perfect photorealistic, you know, photorealistically textured dragon or something. Like I used it like, a, like you just saw, like using it like one would draw something, using it like to make things in the most immediate way possible, which has led to some very comical situations in our work, but also it's led to a lot of uh, epiphanies for me, I think. Um, let's see, wait, before I get into like our game work, I can show you, let me close this, <laughs> and I can show you my very first 3D model, which was not in um, something you probably know, but was in VRML, and it's a little file I like to call E8 Motel, because it was an alternate navigation system for a website, for my website, which was called Entropy8. Um, let's see if I can show it all. I can't navigate anymore. This doesn't run in a web browser anymore. VRML is a dead language. Um, it's hard to find an interpreter. I found this thing that would only read VRML2 files. A lot of my file, VRML files were written in VRML1. Um, and it's because I made this little navigable space because I had been playing an awful lot of this game, Tomb Raider. And I just really loved it, and I thought it was the most beautiful thing. If, if my choice for 3D happened at all, it's because of this game. Um, because I thought it was the most beautiful space I had ever seen. The spaces in this game were more real to me than a lot of real spaces for some reason. And so I tried to emulate that by making a level before I even knew what a level was. Things moved in this thing, you know, you could navigate, you could click on things and end up at different web pages that would open in a different browser window, for example. Um, but once I chose for video games, I was making things that looked more like this. You know, time had gone on. It was no longer 1995 or 96 or whenever I was doing that. And I'm working with Tale of Tales, which is Michael and myself and a bunch of other people. Um, but mainly me and Michael. Like, the, so the Endless Forest, um, we can talk about this for a second. The Endless Forest is a game where everyone plays deer. Um, I don't know if we're going to have any sound. I didn't test the sound. Hold up. No, there's no sound. No sound. That's unfortunate. I'm going to need sound, actually. Um, oh, wait. Maybe it's coming. No, no sound. Can we have sound? It's the one thing I didn't test. But at any rate, it's not so important for this, but it will become important later. <laughs> um, there it is. I hear it. It's coming up. It's coming up. Okay, good. It's good. Yes. So in the endless forest, you're a deer, and you can only do things that deer do, pretty much. You control. You control your deer. You know your avatar via these buttons at the bottom. And um, endless forest is a very special game to us to this day. It was released in 2005. Our first game we released was a multiplayer game, um, <laughs> which is a little odd because everybody says I'm going to make a multiplayer game, and they never do it. We actually did it. Um, but it's um, a funny one because, yeah, you, you wander through the forest and you look for magical... The forest itself is magical. You get the ability to change other people's avatars through the things that you eat or you might lay down in a circle of mushrooms and turn into a frog. Like, you know, it's, and that's really the only game um, that there is to it, is just roaming around and seeing what you might see. Michael and I end up have special pro powers in the game to come in and alter the environment and make flowers like grow and rainfall and snowfall and like um, they invent new things in the world um, and um, the thing is this was like always a very special game for us like for so many reasons not o not least of which that beca being that it's still online but because of the world that we made with just very simple these very simple material of polygons so like this is a drawing yeah you can see it um, that was done by Lina Kusaite, who was the who was the concept artist on this job on this particular game, um, of a character called the character called the Sun Deer that never made it into the game, but it's something I always remembered and loved. And at a certain point, we even had the the character made, but it was never put into the game. But look at how beautiful it is. I don't know. Anyway, there's something about seeing this this material even in its in its raw state. You know, seeing it outside of like the environment of you know the environment that we were making it for, the magic that's supposed to happen in the world, that I still find incredibly charming. Um, our next game, The Graveyard, um, is about you play a little old woman who uh, goes to a, a cemetery, listens to music, and 
and that's really all there is to it. Like we wanted to give players the experience of being a character they normally cannot be in video games. Um, but in my cabinet of curiosities about this game, like I think of things like the bench that is in the game that she goes to sit on. You can see it down there at the end. Um, this is a model I, m I remember making. Um, it's a model that has appeared in three of our video games. It was in this one, it's in a game called The Path, and it's in another game called Bien Tolete, this very same model. I've got the old lady's cane that she's leaning on, and I remember making that model. I've got the, temp the little uh, church chapel that's at the end of the row that's modeled after a real world chapel that's in a cemetery in a town called Isahim in Belgium that Michael went to as a child. I have sentimental attachment to this model. Our other game, next game was called The Path, which came out in 2009. Um, I'll let the video play, but like not fully because it's kind of long. <laughs> Little girls, this seems to say, never stop upon your way. Never trust a stranger friend. No one knows how it will end. As you're pretty, so be wise. Wolves may lurk in every guise. Handsome they may be and kind, gay, or charming, never mind. Now, as then, tis simple truth, sweetest tongue has sharpest tooth. All right, what I remember most about that game is the hours and hours I spent making the entire cast of characters of the path. Check them out here, without textures, without animations. Like, I, at the time, barely had any s skills in 3D. I'd made a lot of 3D models, but to make 12 models in two months was like a really big challenge for me. And it was, so I look at these girls, at these m monsters, whatever. You know, The Path is a horror game based on Little Red Riding Hood, so it's like little red girls and wolves and the, the, the fairy tale. You know how it is. I look at the room that the girls are in at the beginning of the game, this is it. It's seen, shown in the same scale almost as the 3D models of the characters. The grandmother's house, they're told to go to grandmother's house. Here's grandmother's house, the tile that she's on. And I remember this. It's kind of cool <laughs> seeing it in this way, r reminiscing about it. Um, Fatal is the next game that we made. Um, it's about the myth of Salome that I won't go too far into, but it, you know, um, you play a ghost, a ghost of a saint, St. John the Baptist, and you're dead. You've been beheaded. And after your death, you're given one last night to float through the world and live as you always wanted to. Explore as you've always wanted to, I guess, is more to the point. Um, I've got John the Baptist's head right here. got the entire game world right here. Um, our next game, 2000, we're up to 2010 and I'm still doing it. We're, this is a game called Vanitas. I'll let the video play.
Humanitas is a game for iPhones and iPads that is about the sort of luxury devices that we all hold in our hands. Vanitas painting is a form of painting from like the Baroque era pretty much like where it's about paintings that are meant to remind you of the fleetingness of life. So we made an app to remind you of the fleetingness of life. Um, it's filled with objects that you would find in a Vanitas painting. So here, larger than life is my tooth. This tooth was modeled after my actual tooth that had gotten pulled, and I put it in the game. We've got a key that I just made up. We've got, what else did I bid? A wishbone, because I've always thought those were kind of magical objects. I'll, we had a lot of these magical objects in this box, and you can still download the app if you're curious, but yeah, that's what that's about. Bientôt l'été is the next game we made in 2011. I think, or 12, 2012 maybe, 2013, God, I don't know. Um, but it's impossible to describe, so I will play a video for you to try and... There's a man on T Beach, or a woman. I don't know, I'll decide later. The man is alone. There is wind, wind and waves and sky. And the man, or the woman, he closes his eyes, the glowing energy of machines. What? This is not real? He opens his eyes, looks around and around again. Then he walks, or she, and the gulls fly away. The beach is endless. Everything disappears, becomes fluid, becomes immense. We are lost in space, looking for a man or a woman to talk to in French, if possible. Far away, nearly summer. And Bientôt l'été is French for nearly summer. And if that didn't make the whole thing completely clear, um, this is a game that's that where you walk on a beach and you find words, words by Marguerite Duras. You take the words that you found on the beach into the building. In the building, you play a game of chess. The chess board is connected to the words. You meet in that chess game, a man or a woman on the internet, randomly, um, and you play that game and you play those words and you have a conversation while drinking wine and smoking cigarettes. And that is Bien Um The next game was Luxurious Superbia. Um, from Bien and Luxurious Superbia, I was starting to feel it around then, like this feeling, like what am I doing? Um, and so I don't have much from those because I only made the characters in Bientôt l'été and in Luxurious Superbia, it's all procedural. Um, this is a model I didn't make from Bientôt l'été. It's one of the buildings on the, on the boardwalk. Um, Luxurious Superbia, yeah, is a game about sex, but it's all procedurally generated, so there's not much to see. Like, there's no, there is no, there was material, but the material was kind of created on the fly. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll let you see a quick little bit of Luxurious Superbia, you are stimulating your iPad to climax, for lack of a better, for, for no euphemism at all. Um, but you can also play with a friend on a PC um, with multiple joysticks, each being a separate touch. Um, and that was a pretty fun game to work on, but mainly because we were trying to translate the sensation of sex rather than literally portray sex. And that was a really fun um, research process. Um, so, we can talk for a minute about Sunset, um, which was our most recent game, released last year. Um, the cool thing 
I mean, oh, right, well, first, first, first. The, the thing about Sunset was we were trying to, th this being the most recent game and like sort of the culmination of everything we've been working on in a way, we were like, well, let's take all of our knowledge and make this ultimate game. Let's like it, fill it full of all the things that we've been thinking and all the things we've wanted to think, but let's make it accessible for gamers who want a game, you know? I don't know what we were thinking, but um, let's see if I can open this. This is the, uh, the art book that you get when you buy Sunset. Um, and I'm just gonna scroll down to show you some of the influences that we had, like the myriad influences. The game is set in 1972, and you play a housekeeper. Um, you are an immigrant to a fictional town in South America called An San Bavon Anchuria. And um, you, every week at sunset, you clean this apartment, this very swanky, you know, posh apartment of a guy named Gabriel Ortega. And the things we were thinking about, we, we threw ourselves in the research for this game. It's 1972. Michael and I were alive in 1972. But we barely remember it. The 70s have sort of a strange echo effect for us. And we tried to dredge up all those memories. We watched only 70s films. We listened to only 70s mu mu music. I met Angela Davis, for goodness sake, and took a selfie. I, um, I read like volumes and volumes of Ebony and Jet magazine. We went through design, um, design showrooms looking for you know, things that we could put into the fictional world. Basically, we also went to Cuba to research what it would be like to be in a country that was not a democracy, to try and understand, like, if only just a little bit, like, what a different, living under a different system would be like and what it's like for the people there. We did a homestay, we didn't stay in a hotel, we didn't stay in the posh side of town, we stayed in the middle of the neighborhood somewhere, and it was really cool, you know? And I can't say that we really learned, learned anything, but we definitely came away with some impressions that we used to write the diary of Angela Burns, um, the main character that you're playing in Sunset, the housekeeper, and how she felt as an immigrant to a, a, a communist land, a socialist land, a, you know, some place that is not a democracy, the place that she was running away from, actually, because much like Angela Davis, much like Nina Simone, she was leaving the United States to, a, 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 to escape racial oppression, 1972 being a big year for the civil rights movement in the sense of Black Panther Party, of, of protest, of unrest, of violence, and, um, our character was trying to escape that America and seeking a better life for herself someplace else, which is the opposite of what you expect people to do. Anyway, it was sort of important to us to sort of try to understand this in a more physical way than just researching military coups of the 70s in South America, which was also part of this. In other words, we were trying to fill this game with all kinds of political, social ideas and make it easily digestible for for a pl game playing audience, it was a little weird, but um, we we did a Kickstarter for this and it was successful. I think there's audio with this, but it's not. There it is. That's the video I made when we got the, the money for the Kickstarter. It was just like this feeling of jubilation. So jubilant, we got two cats. <sighs> yeah, that's <laughs> this is Ling and that's Louie. Um, and it's completely irrelevant other than cats are cute. Um, um, but at any rate, I art directed the hell out of this game. Like, I, it was a project that we had the largest team that it ever, we'd ever worked with. We put, I put a lot of thought into each object because as the housekeeper, you never meet Gabriel, Gabriel Ortega, your boss. So every object sort of expresses his life in the world and not yours. You know, you're cleaning up his stuff. But at a certain point, a certain relationship can develop in the game, develops in the game um, between you and him. And so it was important what each object was. Each object was like slaved over and I worked with some really wonderful 3D artists. I chose all the art to be real art. So that's a Brancusi sculpture that exists in the real world. These, these, there's the whole series of uh, statues of Hercules. When I was destroying the world at a certain point because their civil war breaks out, I was thinking, what is this? I've made all this stuff and now I'm destroying it. You know, was my, I've had a real feeling of unease about this. Um, but th we wanted a beautiful world, a sun sunlit world, uh, a sinister world, and I think we accomplished it um, for all the, the things that came of the game. Um, 
but I think I have some video next. So yeah, okay, so you can see what it's like to be in the world in these videos. Um, if this is some kind of destiny. The new tenant wants me to clean once a week while he's out, an hour before sunset. We may never even meet face to face. When I reach Gabrielle's home, it feels like I entered a sanctuary, a pocket of surreal calm at the center of a city on fire. The city has a new energy, and I can feel that deep down. Cleaning the windows is soothing somehow, even with the smoke rising on the other side of the glass. There was another explosion last week. You can feel the depression in this place. It feels like everyone in the city is grinding their teeth as hard as they can. Would Gabrielle even notice if I stopped coming? In the middle of a civil war, why is this the thought that haunts me? The man has this job. He brings home encrypted papers and signs them without even reading them. I stood there with my heart pounding and my face burning. I knew my brother and his revolutionary friends needed to know about this. I don't think Gabrielle left those papers out by accident. I don't know if he's a hero or a fool. Free from suspicion, this apartment seems removed from it all, known only to Gabrielle and me. It's a hidden place where I can pretend for a little while none of this is happening. Come back home. I wasn't there when the bomb tore the gallery apart, but the blast reverberates in my head, waking me at night. Men burned and died.
for that sunset. You only ever see yourself in a reflection in glass in that game, and we thought that was pretty interesting, putting people in a body that they could only see reflected. Um, at any rate, it became our last game for all kinds of reasons, one of which was that we realized that we couldn't make a sustainable business out of it, um, out of Tale of Tales in general. Like, even though we'd been doing it for so long and we'd made so many games, we kind of came to this conclusion that we were really bad business people and <laughs> that we probably weren't, shouldn't be trying to sell anything. So why are we trying to sell stuff, you know? Um, and this became super... I don't know. Uh, it was like a, it was like a perfect excuse for like real sh sort of shadowing other reasons why we didn't want to make video games. I think part of the reason why I personally felt video games, commercial video games, we'll put it that way. When I say we're not making video games anymore, it's almost a provocation, I guess. You know, we'll pro we're going to make interactive things. Tale of Tales still exists. But this idea, this Steam thing, this bundle thing, this letting other people control your destiny so much thing um, is what we're not doing anymore. And um, it's, uh, what was I going to say? Um, the real reason I think we shouldn't make games was that we were trying to fit a lot of ideas into a format that perhaps we had outgrown. I'll say that. Perhaps we have outgrown games. Perhaps this material lives for me in another way, and that is something that I needed to explore. And so, let me tell you what I've been doing since I stopped making video games. Everybody is half dead. Everybody avoids everybody. All over the place, in most situations, most all of the time. I know I'm one of those everybody. And to me, it is terrible. And so all I'm trying to do all the time is just to open people up so they can feel themselves and let themselves be open to somebody else. Th that is all. That's it. I've always thought that I was shaking people up, but now I want to go at it more, and I want to go at it more deliberately, and I want to go at it coldly. I want, I want to shake people up so bad that when they leave a nightclub where I performed, I, I just want them to be to pieces. I want to go in that, that den of those elegant people with their old ideas, smugness, and just drive them insane. When I'm calm and cool and really got uh, the antenna working, you know, you know when to push and you know when you know when to not. Nobody can tell you, though. You have to feel it. In any situation between human beings, it's what makes a groove. Well, what's free to you? That's what's what free I'm, to me? Yeah. Same thing it is to you. You tell me. No, no, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Because <laughs> I've been talking for it's such a long time. It's just a feeling. It's just a feeling. It's like, how do you tell somebody how it feels to be in love? How are you going to tell anybody who has not been in love how it feels to be in love? You cannot do it to save your life. You can describe things, but you can't tell them. But you know it when it happens. That's what I mean by free. I've had a couple of times on stage when I really felt free. And that's something else. That's oh. really something <laughs> else. Like all, 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 like, like, I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. I mean, really, no fear. If I, if I could have that, Half of my life, no fear. Lots of children have no fear. That's the closest way, that's the only way I can describe it. That's not all of it. But it is something to really, really feel. <laughs> have you, have you, like, no. I've noticed Like it. a new way of seeing. Like a new way of seeing something. I played that clip of Nina Simone not only because I like it, but because it felt like, you know, mentorship from the grave or something. It felt like, yeah, no fear, you know? I found that I agreed with her and decided to choose for something else. And a lot of what I choose to do is happens in this room. This is my studio, almost at life size, even greater than life size, if you count for perspective. So that's my room. That's where the magic happens. 
I rearranged it after recently, so it's like, you know, this is the latest configuration. Um, I, since I stopped playing video games, I make analog art. I draw a lot. I go to lots of museums. I'm learning traditional printmaking. That's a lithograph I made. This is a lino cut I was working on. That's a painting class I was taking. I was like, yeah, let's get our hands back. Let's do something analog. Why not, you know? Since I've stopped making video games, I've traveled around. We live in a great part of Europe, Belgium, which is in the middle of pretty much everything, so we take road trips to France. First thing I did after Sunset came out is I went to Fontainebleau. I went to Vaux-le-Vicomte. Vaux -Vaux um, I started sketching in exhibitions all the time. I, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I do this, and I'm a little bit obsessive about it. Um, I started playing with my cat designing games with my cat, and I discovered that Ling is the best game designer in our house. Um, she's, together we developed Ball Tosser, Kitty Goalie, Cube Go Round, Featherfly. All really good games that I could diagram out if you ever want to try and play it with your cat. Um, unfortunately, my other cat, is right after Sunset came out, he got ill and passed away, which is really sad because isn't he really cute? Um, and that was a very... It, it made a traumatic situation more traumatic, um, having him pass away. And this slide is intentionally left blank because it's for all the kind of unspeakable things that have been going on in the world that I've noticed since I stopped playing video games. I think that as I showed you that whole list of games and all the things that we've made with Tale of Tales over the past 12, 13 years, that means that most of my life has been spent in continuous development cycles. The reason I haven't been here, come to visit you, is because usually when Ado would ask me, I would be in the middle of a project and I couldn't leave. I wasn't paying attention to anything, hardly. And suddenly I open my eyes and there's like, you know, Ferguson. There's bombs going off in my airport right before I, I'm taking off, you know, in Brussels. There's like, yeah, all of these things that I couldn't, like, I mean, that I knew were going on, obviously, because I'm not dead and I'm not blind, but at the same time, I never let touch me, I guess. And those things suddenly became incredibly important to me once I stopped making video games. One thing I did pretty soon after Sunset came out was I was invited to an artist residency in a town called Ostend in Belgium, which is by the sea. And it was a residence, artist residency research into um, compassion and resistance. And I chose compassion. I hung out with a band called the Ostend Street Orchestra, which are orchestra, which is really cool. Um, they are homeless musicians who get together and gig around Belgium, and um, they have a rehearsal space. And I talked to the guy who runs the the rehearsal space called Klein Verhal, and uh, said, "Well, why don't we invite everybody over, and I'll do a day of portraiture, and that can be my project for the research re re residency." And so they came, and they sh showed up one by one, and I combined it into a giant freeze. Um, not this giant, but pretty giant, <laughs> um, and just said, well, my act, act, act of compassion is simply looking and paying attention and observing. And they were just, at first they were like weirded out, why is she staring at us? And then I was like, oh, pose or whatever. And they were like, oh, this drummer guy, he was the coolest guy. He made me listen to the Rolling Stones all day because I was his favorite band. And it, all he has is his, his drumsticks and his backpack. And after he leaves here, he's just gonna find some place to lay down probably. You know, but at that, during that day, showing them that they were worth observing and worth talking to, they really appreciated that, an artist coming in and depicting them. It's something that most people don't get to experience but in the end, they were like, yeah, you caught him exact, you know, especially this guy. Um, cared. So that's one thing. And then another thing I've been doing a lot since I stopped making video games is 3D capture. First starting out, like all my using, just like everybody else, I get tons of glitches, but I love my glitches. And so these are all things that I've captured using photogrammetry, which giving a workshop tomorrow if anybody's interested in trying stuff. Um, I got a Kinect off of eBay for real cheap, and wow, it looks cool, blown up this big. First thing I did, this is the first scans I made of my, totally of myself, I just picked up the Kinect and pointed it at myself and brought myself into the material. Discovering along the way that I really love how it can get chunky and how it can feel like something else, other than the polygons, those perfectly optimized for animation polygons I'd been making for games, and how much I enjoyed that texture of the material that I'm working with. 
I use that same connect to scan the world around me, my studio, my bedroom, because I'm the Tracy Emin of this shit. Um, and yeah, that was a pretty meditative thing for me to do, just wandering around, taking photos of things, the magic of of capturing form in photographs or through a camera and then having it turn into a model in my machine without me having to build it meticulously from a cube, extruding and extruding and moving vertexes around. Pretty, pretty liberating. So then I go take it all to its logical conclusion. I go to the Louvre and I find something like this wonderful uh, Pigalle sculpture of, 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 of homeboy, yeah, whose name escapes me. And, um, Voltaire, Voltaire, sorry. And, and he's naked and that's kind of cool. And scan it, draw it, make my 3D capture. It's the most perfect capture I got to date, you know, like really closed and really good. 3D print that thing. Then I took a silicon workshop, made a silicon mold, and then printed. I can suddenly make this thing endlessly. Wow, power. I mean, it seems like a small step, but for me it was sort of like, wow, so I can take this material and it's, it's, it's real, it's imagined, it's in the computer, it's out of the computer. It's magic, it's miracles, it's technology. There's nothing wrong with me. So to talk about the magic of this, I'm gonna refer to this paper um, written by some guy at Sun Microsystems in 1993 who is a buddy of mine because of this paper. He feels that the principles of stage magic can be applied to interface design of software programs and can be used to make your software better. Sleight of hand, illusion, other things that he talks about. If you should look up this paper. I don't have time to cover it really in depth, but it's the eerie correspondence, he calls it, between um, between what magicians do on a stage and what we can do in software to, to, in our designs to make the experience one of, you know, real majesty. You know, take, take this program on the other side, that's ZBrush, if you've ever used that. You can just take the victory of Samantrake and bend it into an S. What, I mean, that if you've ever used this program, you know what the magic of technology is. It's, um, it's a kind of, uh, it fools your brain into thinking that you've got a real object, but you're taking the Parthenon sculptures and making an I. You're, you, the letter I. You're building an in out of something. You're, you're just there manipulating the material and bending it to your will without any thought or care about taking the, you know, seated Venus and turning it into a G. You're just doing it. This guy, the guy who does ZBrush, knows about magic and technology. And I think we all do too. Um, in popular imagination, the magic of technology has taken many forms, some good, some bad. Um, but how did we get here? This is my history up here, the simple net art diagram that I love to haul out because it's, it was true then and it's still true to me now. The magic, hap the art happens, the magic, the art happens in the middle. You are the creator, there's the user, you're equal, the art happens here. But nowadays, we've also got this. The, how did we get to there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer? Did, who heard about the cloud and thought for like, for five minutes, I swear I was this, like going, how did they manage to put data in a cloud? Did you have this? I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who actually thought there was a cloud somewhere that they were putting data into and you could like retrieve it somehow? It's like, did they, is it like, you know, they shoot it in a rocket? Like, I really had to like question this for a while, but yes, now someone has made a helpful sticker. And the reason why there's no cloud is because of things I related, I, as with most things, I blame George Bush. Um, this, these are the slides that you can find, just Google it online, of Colin Powell, uh, Powell who was Secretary of State, who was trying to justify the Iraq invasion of, by saying there were weapons of mass destruction in 2003. Big deal, you can find the whole thing. Look at his slides now, and you're just like, that is the most fugly Photoshop, uh, you know, composition I've ever seen. Like, you know, you can tell that they've faked everything. That 3D model, even for 2003, was poor, and they're using this as evidence, saying, oh, yes, we know exactly. They were sort of presenting it like it was fact. Like, we know that this is what the trucks look like. This is how they're constructed. It's dangerous. Be afraid. And then they find out that none of this shit exists, you know. But I think that that use of the material was quite interesting and, and, and sinister and something of a cautionary tale in a funny way. I see it metaphorically. Um, 
more blisteringly new in ta tales of technology and magic is this project by Jan Nikolai Nellis and Nora Albadri, which was super interesting for all kinds of reasons, um, but um, where they say that they went and scanned um, the swiping priceless antiquity with a 3D scanner. This is the bust of Nefertiti, which you can download a 3D model of from their website. And they said that they went into the Neue Gallery, or I forget what it's called, the Neue, I think it's the Neue Gallery in Berlin, and they scanned the head of Nefertiti um, with a Kinect under a, a coat. Which, if you've ever scanned anything with a Kinect, you were sitting there going, oh, hell no. That's not what they did, <laughs> you know? And then later, you know, they, sure enough, a few days later, the New York Times, where this article originally appeared, had to print a retraction. Oh, there have been questions, it's called, their methods have been called into question, and it is perhaps a ho hoax, which you knew three days ago, and which leads a site like The Verge to say the impossibility of stealing a 3,000-year-old head with a video game controller, which, to me, I thought the fact whether they whether they scanned it themselves or not with a connect or not was beside the point. They had an artistic and, and social, like political point to make, and I s accepted it as such. But in the media, to be using this this sort of language of stealing uh, in reference to 3D capture, it's something I've seen before and something that has worried me. It's like uh, to the point where I was like, are they is one day 3D capture going to be something? copyrightable, is that is gonna be illegal, you know, because of this rhetoric of stealing. Are we creating, or are, are we stealing, or are we creating? To me, it's an act of creation, 3D, 3D scanning, 3D capture. When I was in, oh yeah, just as a side note, when I was at the same place years ago, I stood in front of that bust of Nefertiti, and I wanted to stand right in front of it, it's, it's head height, and I wanted to sort of identify with her, with her face, and the, gal the, the guy, the guard in the gallery was like, get out of there, you can't stand there that long, you know, like, shooing me along. So I went down the hall and I took a photo of some photographs of Nefertiti's bust. There was another stone bust that is also the bust of Nefertiti, so I took a photo of that because nobody cared. Nobody cares about that copy of the bust of Nefertiti. They care about the other one. But to me, 3D, a 3D scan or a 3D print of the bust of Nefertiti, no matter how accurate, is no, no copy. It is creation, such as this sculpture by Fred Wilson called Gray Area that's in the Brooklyn Museum, um, which is, you know, or even, let's talk about it, you know, a plaster cast in the gift shop. Same difference. Why stealing? Why, why is this more authentic? When people day after day are 3D scanning like me, like just turning their 3D, so these are pages from 123D Catch, which is an app you can put on your phone for 3D capture. They're capturing their dinner. They're capturing statues because statues don't move. I feel it, you know? Um, this is the sort of detritus of humanity, you know, all rolled up. It's not, but are they stealing those flowers by capturing them? Would a more accurate scan amount to like, somehow, I don't know, capturing the real thing. Um, someone else who's talking a lot about this right now, Morishin Alieri and Daniel Rourke, who I mentioned because it's a really interesting project they're doing called Atavism, which is more about raising awareness about how hilarious the rhetoric and the sort of, um, I don't know, the popular zeitgeist of 3D um, capture and 3D printing is right now. This video over here, which I'll silence, is um, this, a lot of her work, uh, Morshin's work lately, has to do with the, the site of Palmyra and uh, how a lot of people try to recreate um, the cultural, uh, the historical, cult, you know, uh, artifacts that have been destroyed by, you know, terrorists or whatever. You know, the site was recaptured recently by, you know, Russia, by, you know, the good guys and everything, and then there's all this drone footage that's appeared on YouTube. And I'm just like, so now are they going to send something to fly through and 3K, 3D capture the whole thing? Um, they were pointing out through their project Atavism that, you know, we're, Recap, we're capturing things, who owns the data, the 3D data, who has the right to reprint it, who has the, you know, what are we doing when we were 3D printing something? And I just find that interesting. I fell down giant, giant rabbit holes about all of this stuff. And um, I'm passing it on to you. But now let me switch gears a little bit and talk about VR. I'm gonna switch gears a few times because I'm sort of leading into the project that we're working on now and I wanna talk about VR. Um, this is a video of me in the first time that I was immersed in a VR environment. It was a project called Ephemer by a woman named Shar Davies. Extremely interesting project. She was one of the 
I guess, originators of the project of the software Soft Image, which unfortunately was swallowed up by Autodesk and no longer exists. Um, I in 1998 this was, and I drove or had someone drive me from New York City up to Ottawa to just so that I could do this. And um, I would have like given anything to have worked with her back then. It's a very short video because web video wasn't a thing back then. Um, but um, that was me in there. Um, it was a very formative thing for me as well because if there had been home VR right then, I would have like jumped on it. I would have been in it, on it, everything. Um, but there's not, there wasn't. But now we do have VR and it looks like this. A very different situation. The thing about Ephemera was you were sort of in a controller. You had a vest on that was controlled through your breath. You stood on a platform that was controlled by your, your position. I see vi video uh, images like this and I'm just like, okay, no way. This is not the VR future I had in mind. I mean, as I'm sure, you know, this is in popular memes, this has shown up. I w let me just say that my problem with this has a lot to do with the fact that you are cut off from the world and cut off from your body. Where is your body when you're in VR? These, the, you know, I just have nothing but questions. You know, where is your body when you are in VR? Um, what is happening to your body? What are you being fed by whom? Um, and, I, and I would state that my preference is for um, sort of what I call VR opera glasses, which is more like the cardboard approach of, you know, you pick up something and you look into it and you put it down, you pass it around. That's just my preference. Um, we can talk about it, we can debate it, whatever, but it, I find that to be a much more provocative and interesting um, way of engaging with VR, something that leaves you with some agency. Um, moving on, we can talk a little bit about God. Um, this is a project by Eric Berglund and Clement Valla called Icano Clashes, which is really super cool and you should look it up. We, I found it during that rabbit hole that I fell down looking at atavism and stuff. Basically, they took, they wrote software which uh, queried Met's database for images that were about, that contained deity or God, and then they found two and they meshed it together in Photoshop's uh, um, photo uh, measure, photo stitcher, um, and it's like a lot of art today is about how did they do that, and it's like in this way it's sort of both clear and unclear how they did it, but I like it as a way of expressing the confused state we all have about the nature of God, or gods, or our spirituality in general. Um, other things that I found that myself fascinated by was this hashtag on Twitter called Museum Selfie, which you know, maybe you've done it, maybe you know someone who's done it, but you see a beautiful painting and all you want to do is emulate it. You want to take on that position. Why do people do that? I don't know. God.js is a, I won't go too deep in depth, in it, but it's a Chrome extension which supposedly allows you to create and disseminate your own religion. Um, pretty cool, um, but I have my issues with it as well. We'll see. Um, I'm showing you this picture this video of people walking into the Sistine Chapel. You're not allowed to take photographs in the Sistine Chapel. So, but if you Google or go to YouTube and look for Sistine Chapel ceiling, you will find hundreds of videos of the Sistine Chapel ceiling looking just like this. Someone eventually tells this person to put down the camera and they put it down. It's like, or, or people who are very sneakily, you know, doing this. Why do you do that when you can just go buy a book that has high resolution pictures or you can just go to Google and Google it and find hundreds of videos? You need your own for some reason. I'm fascinated by what makes people want to do that. Um, and in the realm of relics, this is a, a Christian relics. Um, this is called the Scala Sancta. It's in Rome. And it is a staircase which leads nowhere. Um, in the Christian um, religion, in their whatever um, ritual, you might say, you're expected to go to this staircase. There's a chapel built around it. And climb the staircase on your knees, and for every stair, you say a prayer. And the story about this relic is that it was brought back from the Holy Land by the mother of Constantine, St. Helena. Constantine the Great was the Roman emperor who spread the Christian faith in the Roman Empire. She brought it back because this was supposedly the staircase that Jesus Christ climbed on his way to be um, sentenced to death. It's the staircase to Pontius Pilatus' uh, palace, supposedly. And this is the original. However, there are, so they say, these are, there's copies. This is a copy in Pittsburgh. 
where you're expected to do the exact same thing. This is a copy in Lourdes, Spain, where you do the same thing. And this is a copy in, I think, in um, Slovakia. I, don't, I forget where this one is. Pro maybe it's Czech Republic. Ah, I forgot. But same thing. Nobody cares which one is the original. Um, all of these are copies, and yet they are the original. And there's something fascinating for me about that. And in a lot of ways, it's all of these things that I've sort of been leading up to that are about our latest project, Cathedral in the Clouds. Um, sucker. Michael and I have done a lot of work around religion, a lot of things that I involve religion. This is kind of a timeline of like somehow it's always coming back to religion and we don't know why exactly. Never dealing directly with it, but um, sort of thinking about it. I have a little thing here where I, let's see, I guess notable projects would be our God Love Museum, which was one of the first web projects we did, which actually has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible, but we thought we were going to go through and make sort of these autobiographical um, sketches, interactive sketches, um, based on each book <sighs> of the Bible. So like when we met, it was such a momentous occasion. We felt like it's the genesis of something. It is the beginning. And then I left <sighs> the United States in 1999, and it, so it was Exodus. So we made a chapter called Exodus. Leviticus <sighs> was about all the laws that were keeping us apart from by me being an American and him being a European and us traveling back and forth and me overstaying a tourist visa probably uh, or two <sighs> a couple of times. And then Numbers um, being about our personal sort of hang-ups, culture clashes between us and how we didn't always get along like we thought we would. And Deuteronomy being the sort of going, as it was in the Bible, sort of going back over all the other books and finding that we had to leave the promised land one way or another. So we put it all together. And yeah, with a healthy dose of yeah sighing. Another project we did was called Eden.Garden, which was a web parser. You, you could type in any URL, um, and it would go fetch the HTML of the page, and it would turn all those HTML tags into animals and trees and all of that. So you would get your own Garden of Eden. Behind every web page was a Garden of Eden that you could explore. Michael and I were Adam and Eve, of course, and we were, were seen doing really weird gestures in the game. I mean, in this particular, I don't know, maybe this is the beginning of us so calling stuff a game, um, that are sort of parodies of Quake, um, Quake things like, you know, Quake uh, being a video game of the time, like, like shooting, falling, but like sort of making fun of it and turning it into a dance. Um, just dancing to the, the, the text, the raw text of the, of the web page in these sort of exaggerated movements. Um, anything else? No, we'll leave it at that. I mean, I think The Endless Forest, the first game I talked to you about, had a lot of um, a certain sacredness, sacred feeling to it. Um, and to this day, people make up all kinds of mythologies about dear gods and, you know, why certain ruins are there and what's that statue and things like that. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, all this, wherever my slide put it, okay, um, has been um, very important to us. And... Um, so we don't feel odd about that. Suddenly we're like interested in sacred architecture and how it's built and why it's built and the rituals that happen within it. Um, also coming into this is things that look like, paintings that look like this. When we were looking at, uh, these are all made in the region where we live, Flanders, Flemish primitive artwork. That painting uh, in the middle, I, which I can't point to, is in our cathedral. The, um, it's called the Ghent Altarpiece by the Brothers Van Eyck. And so I go and look at that all the time. We're surrounded by this stuff, and we look at it, and we say, why does it look so peculiar? And one of the things that we were thinking about was, well, you know, the reason why that woman can stand in that architecture and be so large, she's the most important subject of that particular altarpiece, and it's because they didn't have cameras. So we started thinking about like, what is a non-photo, perhaps the sacred is linked for us to this non-photographic sensibility. This idea that like, yeah, her breast is there, you know, <laughs> like it's up really high, but like that's where it belongs, you know? And like, um, 
like this sort of non-Euclidean, like how could we free our minds enough to think non-photographically? Can we free our minds enough to think non-photographically? Have I been a slave to a camera all these years? Like if you think about your 3D engine, if you make games, if you've ever looked at Unity or something, we call it a camera, it acts like a camera, you change its aperture like a camera, but why? It could be anything. You know, so we're trying to think about in the cathedral in the clouds, like what's it like to be in a world where your imagination is not bound by that way of seeing, perhaps seeing into the beyond is about seeing the face of your God. And uh, we're kind of envious of that. Like, what's it like to have to picture that and not have all these other pictures in your mind? What is that, what did that, what was that like for people back then? What was this artist thinking when he was trying to communicate this story to people who could not read, perhaps, and who I he wanted to get across this you know, story which was about not just, I don't know, not just about the image, not painting about paint, but about their very soul. That's Michael, by the way. Hi, Michael. Um, so we did a lot, we've been doing lots of research as we do, you know, but not, not crazy, you know, just doing some research, you know, into sacred architecture, and one of the best books I found on the subject is called The Symbolism of the Christian Temple by Jean Hany, who is a uh, intellectual, and I don't know what else, in uh, Amiens, which is where in France, which is an uh, important, because uh, there's a very important cathedral there, really beautiful one, um, and the, he has a good way of sort of discussing this, wait a second, I'm going to read you a quote if I can find my notes where I put it, you show presented notes um, about sacred art. True sacred art is not a is not of a sentimental nor a psycholo psychological. It's not sentimental nor psychological, but an, of an ontological and cosmological nature. This being so, sacred art will no longer appear to be the result of the feelings, fantasies, or even the thought of the artist, as with modern art but rather the translation of a reality largely surpassing the limits of human individuality. Sacred art is the vehicle of the divine spirit, the artistic form which allows transcendent and supernational truths to be directly and not discursively assimilated, as is the case with reason. Sacred art, therefore, prolongs the incarnation, the descent of the divine into the created. So yeah, it's kind of heavy, but basically what he's trying to say is that Sacred art is not about you, and it's not about me. It's about something else. It's about the collective. So not only do, was it just something so simple, simplistic as thinking beyond the camera, it's thinking of beyond myself, thinking beyond the individual and into the collective. The cool thing about um, sacred architecture to me, or a cathedral in specific, is that every single thing means something. That even the act of going through the door is a ritual that there's a symbolic nature to this thing, this cathedral that you see in the landscape today. Our ca architecture is full of boxes. You see a cathedral and it looks like a spaceship has landed. But it's not a spaceship, it's you and me. It's the human body laid out in a map of the heavens, almost. And that I find fascinating because it's something I feel that resonates even when I go into the, the space today. As a non-believer, I look at the, the, you know, things like the stained glass, and I try to read the stories, and uh, most of them don't make sense to me, but I make sure that I ask myself, what am I looking at, and why is it formed in this way? And I find a lot of inspiration and a lot of solace in that, in that art, the fact that artisans have made this thing, sp this space specifically for me to come and understand something about myself. Um, this is another chapel called Notre Dame du Haut, that which was designed by Le Corbusier, who is a modernist, so it's a modernist chapel. But it was created in such a way that the service could take place inside or outside simply by turning around a votive statue that's in the window there. If you face it outwards, the service can happen outside, and if you face it inwards, the service happens inside, sort of mirrors of each other. And it's a really beautiful um, thought like sort of a generous thought, a thinking outside of like, this is our, our congregation, but our congregation is the world. We went and we sort of followed the Camino de Santiago, which is a pilgrimage route in Spain, well, leading all across Europe, but ending in the very tip of Spain in Santiago de Compostela. 
Um, we didn't walk it. We just kind of faked it. We drove. But we, one thing I just found out is everywhere you see this symbol, that's a, a pilgrimage space, a place where you can stop and people know that you're a pilgrim and they'll be nice to you or give you a place to stay, something to eat. You know, it's, a, it's, it's how you know where to go on that route. Um, I thought that was interesting to know that this symbol is out there and that I can just find it. When, and when you get to the, the um, Santiago de Compostela Cathedral, this is what you see. I'm glad this projection is this big because it's almost like what you, I mean, it sort of gives you an idea of the scale. That's a person there. Those angels are gigantic, huge polychrome angels, gaudy gold. That's the, the relic of St. James there in that square box there. That is the organ that's sort of looming above everything, covered in babies and angels and like whatever, who knows what. Just completely out of, out of control, off the chain. Like, what is this, you know? What was that like when you went there, like long centuries ago? That's the kind of thing I enjoy. See, I think what I'm getting at is like, you know, video games are about all this like lore and like fantasy and everything. But I just am enjoying the fact that there's all this fantasy and lore in the real world that already exists and perhaps is something that I can tap into. Um, one of the things that happened in, while we were there and went, we went to mass, like a lot of people do because it's very theatrical, like um, there's this, you know, the, in the Catholic mass, there's like uh, incense that is spread throughout the room via a little incense burner, but they had a gigantic one. It took five guys to swing it, but they did it at exactly this certain moment where the sun had, was coming through the transept of the church so that you got massive God rays coming through right at that perfect moment. And I was like, ah, well played, guys, well played. Because at that moment, you felt it, felt something, no matter whether you believed or not. I'm fascinated by things like labyrinths and cathedrals. Why is that there? It's a totally pagan thing. I mean, coming from the myth of uh, Theseus and the Minotaur, Ariadne, helping uh, Theseus escape. And I came through research to find that it's uh, a metaphor for that pilgrimage. Perhaps you were, this is one theory anyway, that it was put into early Christian churches and now it's left there as a sort of um, alternate pi pilgrimage route. Um, walking a, a labyrinth is something that's very important and meditative for a lot of people. Um, and you know, the thing about a labyrinth, it's not like a maze where you can get lost. A labyrinth always le leads inexorably not to the center. And a lot of pe games arouse or came about because of this idea of the pilgrimage and the labyrinth. And I found that really super interesting. Like the, the also as a, as a way of thinking about pilgrimage and the sort of resolution of your sins. Um, so all of these things, all these thinking, all these like, thoughts go into what we're going to build, which we still don't know what it is yet. So like I said, I have nothing to present to you, but like, you know, silly blue <laughs> like cloud thing, you know, with water. What is that? I don't know. But it's like we know that we don't want to pretend that our cathedral is made of stone, and we don't want to pretend that we're going to like somehow supplant um, these real sacred spaces, but perhaps we're thinking that what is a digital sacred space like? What is it for? Who is it for? Can we make a space where people come together and give them something that they can take with them that helps them in contemplating their daily life? So much about the internet, I guess, and I guess my point about VR and who makes it and what you're seeing and who's in control of like the economy of it is about wanting to do what we did with the endless forest, but like more seriously, like create a safe space where people can come and think about their lives, think about their problems, think, and, and we want the building of the space, the ritual that we may create in the space along with the people who come there to um, be something that can actually help people in some way, like, or not. Maybe they just come because it's beautiful, you know, but offering them a way and things that they can look at and contemplate and um, stories that they can read in the, in the space, um, yeah, in general. Um, I'm going to show you just a moment of a video that we made uh, during a big research trip that we took looking at cathedrals. I won't show you the whole thing, but there's some notes in it that sort of shows our line of thinking. And um, Oh, right, yeah, this is a 3D scan of, of the cathedral in Ghent, by the way. Yeah, I forgot about that. And that's us wandering around <laughs> in that cathedral, sort of enjoying ourselves, looking so happy. But anyway, it's a beautiful space, and I'll show you some new other ones. 
now. That's enough of that. But so that was actually my talk. <laughs> Thank you for coming and yeah. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Did I go terribly over? Like <laughs> that was a lot of stuff, I know, I'm sorry, but yeah, it was a lot on my mind. So Okay. Okay.
So if anyone has any questions or comments or thoughts or anything, questions. Oh, sorry, I'm blinding you. Yeah, okay, yeah. Maybe we could turn the lights up or something so it's not quite so dark and sleepy. Yeah, Casey. Okay. Oh God, yeah, yeah, we have, but at the same time, we're sort of surrounded by this sort of, we live in one of the few Catholic countries in the north of Europe, like the rest is all Protestant, and to us it's sort of interesting, that situation and sort of what we know. We worry about trying to uh, interpret other religions. It's like even though I'm not born Catholic like Michael is, like in into a Catholic situation or society or culture, um, I still feel that I am connected to that through art. And it's sort of like we are trying to connect th to the sacred through artwork. And um, I don't want to try to get all like multi -culti, international on it, pretending like I understand somebody else's culture right now. I just don't feel that. So we're sticking to uh, Catholicism because it's what we are uh, comfortable with and what we feel um, inspired by. Yeah, that's it. But I am very interested in, in sacred spaces in general and their use. So uh, it's not that it's something that, it, it's definitely something that will be part of the research. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think right now we have very vague notions of what we want to do with the space. We first want to build it and then see, put, allow people to enter it and see what happens to that in that situation. And also, um, I didn't mention, but we did a Kickstarter for this project as well, and people who donated to that have become sort of our... Uh, uh, first members of the Cathedral in the Clouds, you might say, and so we would want to talk to them, um, sort of play testers, you might say, you know, and see how the space gets used by them, like, pr or, or things that we notice through, our, through, our, through the use of the design. Um, I'm interested in ritual and coming up with a ritual for the space also, uh, but it could be, uh, yeah, I mean, I just have all kinds of wild ideas about that, you know, perhaps, or perhaps it's like Michael thinks that we like invite a priest to like do actual mass in that thing, you know, and see what happens. I mean, I, I have all these other questions too, like not only about the positive uses of the space, but the negative. Like, um, you know, what happens if iconoclasm comes to our temple? You know, <laughs> what happens if people see it as like, you know, oh, they're trying to convert people to this religion? Um, I, I enjoy thinking about possibly the negative connotations as much as the positive, you might say, and what we can do against that. And I keep using the Endless Forest as, a, uh, as a, an example for this for a reason, because it's been online for like over 10 years. And like the first thing that sort of frustrated trolls about the Endless Forest was it was impossible to sort of grief people in the game because it's just, you're just being a deer, you know? It's like, you know, you couldn't do anything, and they were really frustrated by this in the first, like, five years of that game's inception. They were like, how can we go in there and, like, troll all these lamers who are, like, in this game space, you know? So it's like, I think that through that experience, we sort of discovered how we can make a space, a safe space, and an, a space that feels um, inspiring to people. And now we just want it to be, I don't know why we're so interested. I mean, a lot of what we're doing right now is figuring out why we're so interested in all this stuff and how we can through um, our connection to the art of the past make something thoroughly um, contemporary and, and have that conversation back and forth. Yeah, it's all kind of vague for us now, but yeah, Vita. That is the goal, yes, that is the goal. Well, you know, we'll try single, but I think that part of what's beautiful about mass is that you're there with other people. 
and that it is this collective experience. Like I said, it's like the sacred is not about you and me. It's about that collective. It's about being there together. That feeling of community, I think that's something that people look for online, but then are often disappointed by, or the communities get I taken advantage of. You know, like if you think about why people use Facebook or something, you know, it's like they're all there and then they, like their data is getting collected and they're uncomfortable with it, but they keep on using it and they think it's the internet and like, you know, it's like we want to just create an, a space that we know, where people know that they can come to and be with others and feel that human presence, but perhaps you're not a human being, you know, perhaps you're just a ball of light, perhaps you're just a, you know, I don't know. It's it, I think that people who play the Endless Forest find it very valuable that they know that that other creature that they're playing with is another human being, even though they can't talk, you know? Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. It would just be some way of feeling the presence, the human presence, which I actually find more powerful, like having gone through the Endless Forest and making games all these years and everything. I actually find it more powerful to know it's a person but not be confronted with them. You know, and it's just more about like this fact that we're all there together and we have this, yeah, you have that idea. Well, yeah, it's about this creating the ideal in a, in a funny way. It's like you have that ideal moment with another human being of, of that connection with each other without, without all the crap, you know, without having to deal with their bad attitude, without having to like, you know, but, um, and yeah, and I do feel like that it's part of mass is like there's this moment what my favorite moment in Catholic Mass is when everybody greets each other. You like you have to turn to one another and shake each other's hand. And it's just this really beautiful moment of connection. It's like I don't know you but hello and it's often people hug or like they say hello. And it's like and it's meaningless in a, in and of its on its face, you know, but at the same time there's something really sort of um I don't know, beautifully human about it. No. We're, it, I don't know if you played our games, we're not very big on collision detection in the first place, you know? In the Endless Forest, you can walk through trees, but it just makes something beautiful happen. So we'll probably continue that tradition. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. I think I see where you're going with this. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I can, of course, I'm getting visions of, like, everybody sitting in some sort of, like, room, climate-controlled room, you know, like, with the headset on, like, in mass or something. That'd just be really weird. Um, n I'm going to say no. I'm not interested in any of those things, actually. Um, but I could become interested in them, um, depending on where all this leads, but I don't know. It's It really is, we, we often, in our work, think about that individual person at their computer, you know, having a private m moment. Like, I think all of our games were designed for that. Um, and caring about that person's body who is experiencing this digital thing. Um, and I, I think that that is, let, like now, maybe now we're caring less about their body and more about their spirit or something. And that's intangible. And Again, it's not, it's beyond the physical, perhaps. I don't know. I care about their body, but at the same time, I'm caring more about their spirit, perhaps. Yeah. So I don't want to get too tricksy with things, you know? We want to allow people a way in, in various, through various ways, like, you know, VR. I'm not saying that I would never do anything for a Rift or a v Vive or whatever it's called. Um, but perhaps it would have to be in a situation where their bodies could be taken care of, you know? Um, maybe it's enough that you can ha go someplace and have a portal into this, pick it up and be there for a moment, download something and take it with you. Um, 
maybe you know maybe that's enough like maybe we don't have to take this too far i don't know so i'm not so interested in t also i'm terribly not interested sorry not interested in technology like i will never be hyped about technology ever again after the life i've had um, I've seen technologies come and seen them go, I tell you. You know, it's like, and, and we used to have this um, saying, Michael and I, when we were making websites, that technology is not the future, we are. And by that, we didn't mean we, he and I, we meant we as humans. And it's like, I refuse to think of technology like nature or like that technology is even important. Um, I think that it's humans and what they program that technology to do and being accountable for that, that's important. And so knowing that, like, I wanna think through what I'm doing with technology and not the tech. To me, it's like, you know, th it's VR now and it'll be gone in five years, for all I know, VR. You know, and, and what I actually suspect is that, um, you know, in terms of games in VR, right now is the time to be playing with VR and understanding what what can be done with it and trying to build what what might become the the default navigation system you know that's going to happen whether you want it to or not there's at some point going to be a default navigation system that will be imposed upon you and this two percent of a two percent that it can afford to get a vr headset is going to say damn it you went against the, the norm you suck you're creating something terrible how dare you do this i'm confused you're confused you know even though there's no reason for that default to even be there that is the situation in gaming today where if you don't use the same navigation system that everybody else uses, they think something's wrong with you. When navigation systems, programming, human-machine interaction is a very fascinating thing, in mainstream gaming, you kind of can't do it without a bunch of crap being rained on your head um, or a lot of misunderstanding. Um, so I think that in VR, this is going to happen. I give it five years, me being, let me predict the future. Um, and so the time is now, and it's a small window. And I've lived through it like three times, two or three times already, where something you think is wide open and everything, will, this changes everything, and this is going to be wonderful, and I can do anything, turns out to be distilled down into something. Turns out to be distilled into blogs, you know? Turns out to be distilled into Valve software, Steam, like downloads, and not this wonderful medium that you chose for, which is software, which can be anything. So that's what I think about that. Yeah. And is that it? <laughs> Thank you.